All right, so we're going to talk about emerging diseases in uh, the global swine herd, and so I'm just going to hit on that briefly. Um, if you look at what's happening globally, uh, horse enteric coronavirus is, is uh, obviously emerging. Um, there's uh, um, actually in 2012, I was chair of the uh, American Association of Swine the Veterinarians Health Committee, Swine Health Committee, and um, there was a veterinarian that examines global disease emergence, and he warned us in that meeting. I don't know if Troy, you were there. He said, you know, we, be, we better be watching this PED thing in China. And we all said, yeah, okay, great. Well, it wasn't a year after that we're dealing with PED in the United States. Um, the other enter enteric coronavirus is uh, porcine delta coronavirus. PERS is evolving all the time. Uh, it's an RNA virus, mutates easily, obviously influenza. We have new strains all the time. Porcine uh, circovirus right here. Um, it's a DNA virus, but it's changing so rapidly that it's, it's kind of unique for a DNA virus to change that rapidly. We started out with PCB2A, and then we went B. Uh, C's gone, we had C, and now we have a new strain called, they've named PCB2D. Um, and so that's been a rapid change. African swine fever, we'll touch on that briefly. That's a big concern for our industry. Classical swine fever. And then I had an Ebola here. I, I think uh, with the emergence of Ebola, uh, it's something the swine industry needs to, needs to keep an eye on. So we know we have rest in Ebola virus in, in uh, positive pigs. It was diagnosed in the Philippines oh, three, four years ago. Uh, there again, uh, it's not Dizir or Zaire uh, Ebola, which is what's nasty in humans, but uh, they did infect pigs that had the same airspace as macaques, which are our subhuman primate. And without direct contract, it was aerosol spread to those animals. And so um, it's something that, that we're looking at um, it, because it is obviously a zoonotic uh, disease, and so that's a, a major concern. Um, today, uh, Ebola virus in pigs does not cause any clinical disease whatsoever. Um, so if you look at African swine fever, um, it really has spread uh, throughout uh, Russia and now Ukraine, more recently in Poland. And uh, so it's in the EU and uh, Lithuania, um, and it's really impacting a lot of the trade and things there. It's a good example of uh, where producers uh, start seeing dying pigs. And so because there's no indemnity or they can't trust the government coming to pay for their pigs, they start slaughtering them, and then they start selling the meat. And so this virus can stay in meat for long, long periods of time, even processed meats like bacon. Uh, and so rather than take the big hit, they start, they start to butcher these animals at home, and then they start selling the meat wherever they can sell it. And so um, it's really a lack of control. It's almost it's nose to nose primarily, and as long as you have some type of biosecurity around your facility, fences and, and uh, contained uh, uh, animals in confinement, uh, it's, it's not easily spread, but these same people that are doing chores and things for buying this meat and bringing it into the farm. So, uh, let's talk. Uh, what uh, Carla asked me to talk about was forcing coronaviruses in the U.S. swine herd, and uh, it's an envelope virus, uh, which means typically uh, they like cold weather better. And so, uh, we'll show. I'll show you some graphs here. Uh, recently emerged human coronaviruses are SARS. Uh, we started out in China as well, and uh, the, the practitioner uh, that was treating these people had no idea what he was dealing with, decided to go to a wedding, and he was clinically ill at the time, stayed on the ninth floor in, in a hotel in, in uh, Hong Kong, and everybody on the ninth floor then left that hotel and seated down the hospital systems uh, in the rest of the Canada, wherever they ended up. And uh, would have been a really uh, neat epidemiological study uh, because Everybody assumes it's aerosol spread, but he stayed on the eighth, ninth floor, so a pretty large hotel. He checked in at the front desk, and only the people on the ninth floor uh, came down with this virus. And so he started thinking about doorknobs and, and uh, things like that that he was, he was touching up there. Uh, porcine coronavirus, uh, we have a respiratory form and an enteric form. Um, 
They're coronaviruses because they have this kind of crown or halo that's Latin for crown is corona, and so it kind of describes the virus. Um, so we have three different types of, of, transmis of coronaviruses that are, that are enteric, uh, TGE, which has been around forever. Uh, hey, John. And uh, more recently, porcine epidemic virus, we'll talk about that in a little bit, and then uh, the Delta coronavirus. Uh, there's also a respiratory coronavirus that's in pigs, porcine respiratory coronavirus. And actually, there's some cross-protection between the respiratory coronavirus and TGE. And uh, many, many herds in the United States have respiratory coronavirus. And I think uh, we don't see as severe TGE as we used to because of the cross-protection there. It's not 100%, but it's, it does help um, in those cases. And these are the two that have recently emerged in the United States. Um, if you look at the timeline, uh, it was first reported, diagnosed in May of 2013. Uh, practitioners were submitting samples thinking they had TGE, and the lab results kept coming back negative. And so these practitioners said, you know, your test must be terrible, or it must not be working. Well, then Iowa State uh, had a virologist there that ran a pan-coronavirus uh, PCR on that, and they knew it was a coronavirus, it just wasn't TGE. And so as they drilled down, uh, they diagnosed PED. And so Iowa State also had some samples, some fecal samples they were doing, they, were, uh, they had preserved or kept frozen uh, to do a basically a diarrhea study. And uh, they went back and looked at those samples. And the virus had actually been in the United States since April. And so um, in June, there was another variant that was discovered. Uh, it's called the Endale strain. I believe the Ohio Department of Agriculture reported this in 2014. It's a milder strain. Uh, animals don't get near as sick. Uh, and then um, in 2014, there was a third strain that was diagnosed um, in February of 14, 2014. Uh, also at the same time, the Delta coronavirus was discovered in the United States. And that virus was first identified in China in 2012. So in less than a year, we had three new viruses, uh, PED viruses show up, all traced back to China, and a Delta coronavirus traced back to China as well. Now, that's a very big concern for our industry, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. PED causes uh, severe diarrhea in young piglets, typically below seven days of age, uh, basically 100% mortality in those piglets. Um, it goes in and it uh, basically uh, destroys all the epithelial cells on the small intestine villi, and uh, pigs less than seven days of age, it takes seven days or longer to regenerate those villi, and so they basically dehydrate before they have a chance to recover. Older animals can do that regeneration in two to three days. And so you'll see clinical signs, but morbidity, not much mortality. Uh, whoops. Uh, when this first happened, uh, there were actually what we call the origin paper. There were some researchers that actually traced the virus using uh, sequencing uh, back to a province uh, in China. And uh, it happened to be, uh, and we, I believe is how it's pronounced, uh, province down in here, where the original PD virus came from. Um, unfortunately, we did nothing with that information. Uh, we didn't go back and say, we know where it came from. How did it get from there to the United States? And we didn't uh, really act very much upon that. Uh, a lot of uh, talk about feed ingredients. Most of the vitamin trace mineral premixes uh, are come from China and exported from China into the United States and fed to our animals. Uh, when this virus first broke out uh, in, in May, we had five different farms in five different states report this disease within a two-week period. And so that's where the feed mentality came from. This, it's got to be they weren't using the same feed mills. There was no correlation between the farms as far as sharing vehicles or sharing trucks or sharing employees. They were far away from each other. Um, so feed ingredients became uh, implicated initially. Um, the outbreaks in Ontario, they actually traced that back to spray dyed porcine plasma that originated in the United States. And a lot of talk about, well, it's contaminated, but I talked to the veterinarians that were testing that product. Brand new bags. They open them up, take a sample, PCR positive, which means the antigen's there, 
than they did bioassay, put it in the pigs, and actually made the pigs sick. So um, I have, I'm friends with a veterinarian that's uh, responsible for a very large system, and uh, they have their own, they're integrated, they have their own packing plant, they produce sprayed right porcelain plasma, they run tests on it all the time, it's, it's PCR positive, but they go ahead and feed it to naive pigs and they never get a sick pig. So the process uh, probably can be done correctly um, and, and not transmitted. For some reason, uh, Ontario got a bad batch of, of plasma protein. And uh, so that's, uh, that's where it's been implicated in, in some of the feedstuffs. Uh, the, uh, if you look at coronavirus dendrograms, uh, you can see PEDs up here. It's a delta. It's an alpha. A TG is also an alpha coronavirus. And the deltas we have are clear down here in uh, the delta um, branch. SARS is beta. Um, and uh, so it is, it is coronaviruses are broken out by alpha, gamma, beta, and uh, delta. Oops. And this uh, is a dendrogram I got from, uh, I received from, I well, actually called Dick Hesse, and he had uh, some, some people on his staff work it up from the Kansas State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. And you can see the blue ones here are strains that were diagnosed in the United States and sequenced, um, clusters very nicely with the Chinese um, group. And uh, so China's had PED since 1980. Europe is down in here. Uh, they've had PED since the 1970s. Um, so the question, and it's not like we started buying vitamin trace minerals from China in 2013. What's different? There's a fundamental change that happened uh, how this virus started getting into the United States. And, and so the concern is that portal is still open. Thank goodness it wasn't foot and mouth disease. Of course, in China, you can't say that. You've got to say disease number five. Uh, Makes you wonder what one through four are, right? And uh, um, or even classical swine fever. Uh, or now there's a new pseudorabies virus so circulating around China. And so uh, we feel like we kind of dodged the bullet here and gave us a chance to. I'll talk about some things that are going on in the pork industry today to uh, to hopefully mitigate the next one that comes because we feel it's going to happen. Um, so something's fundamentally changed here, and if you look at I even, uh, when I did some research on this, I contacted David Meeker with the National Render Society and, and, or Association, and, and he, uh, we got to talk about uh, variant CJD in humans and BSC in, in cattle in the UK, and all the theories around that was about the right time, the renders had dropped an extrusion process, right? And everybody said, well, that's what did it. Well, they've done enough work to show that that isn't what, what happened. Uh, they blamed it on knackers, which are people cooking products in the backyard. Well, the knackers have been doing that forever. Uh, the cattle industry in the UK have been, feed, been feeding meat and bone meal forever. Um, and, uh, however, uh, the UK imported some raw material from India in the right time period, brought it over to have it processed, and it was common knowledge that there was human remains in that, in that material. And so they really think they introduced a TSC from humans into the, uh, the cattle feed at that point in time. So there again, a fundamental big change. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to identify what that is in this portal that's coming from China today for the US. Um, lessons that we learned. Um, you know, it was interesting because when we first found out about it in May of 2013, by the middle of June 2013, we put our research, uh, proposal research out there for requests for, for proposals uh, to look at the, the gaps that we had in the knowledge base for PED. And uh, the Pork Board had $1 million committed to PED research by the middle of June. Uh, very rapid research funding to fill knowledge gaps. A little behind where it needed to be, uh, but uh, tremendous response. Uh, we had increased, we need to have increased industry state federal collaboration. The diagnostic lab network was phenomenal. As quickly as they jumped on that, there were no tests for PED other than this pan-coronavirus that they started out with. So we had to have you know, real-time PCRs and uh, IFAs were developed and then ELISAs. And so diagnostic labs really, I mean, they dropped everything to, to focus on this, this issue and, and develop these tests. Uh, we had a little, um, we'll talk about 
You know, with foreign animal diseases, it's basically a regulatory effort. And so essentially plans are pretty well laid out for a foreign animal disease. This was a transboundary disease, so it's not reported, not reportable. It's not a regulatory event. And so we have a lot of this stuff going on where industry is saying, well, how come USDA is not taking action? USDA is saying, well, what do you need us to do? We have no authority. And so I think we realized that this doesn't do anybody any good. We just need to get industry, state, and federal collaboration together and try to figure out what's going on and how is it spreading and what do we need to do to get it stopped. Something else that happened out of this was we'll talk about the Swine Health Monitoring Project. Basically, it's where producers, I mean, with PED, producers finally started sharing health information. And that's a big change from what it was before. Everybody was worried about confidentiality. Nobody wanted to share. When PED hit, now all of a sudden we have all these producers saying, hey, I'll share. I'll let you know what we got. I'll let you know our status for farms. And so having this producer communication has just been huge and very open communication at that point in time. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. The Swine Veterinarian, American Association of Swine Veterinarians, are going through a pathogen matrix exercise, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. It's where they list all, well, right now we're working on the virus list, the 44 some viruses, and we're ranking those according to certain criteria, and we'll walk through that. I think you've heard of secure pork supply, very similar to the secure egg supply and the secure milk supply. It's industry, state, federal effort for FAD preparedness, and they're going to allow movement of animals if you do certain things and you're actually qualified to move those animals. We're moving about 750,000 pigs per day in the U.S. Some people say even as high as a million, and you just can't stop movement on that many pigs. They have to go somewhere. And so to get this in place so people have the right monitoring, the right biosecurity, can move animals, that's going to be key. That's going to take federal, state, and industry collaboration to make sure we get that done. Rapid response teams, basically that's a USDA industry collaboration. So we used veterinary services, USDA vet services epidemiologists, and then we took a practitioner and they went out and investigated some of these farms that were breaking that were considered epidemiologically distinct. How in the world did this farm get this virus? And so we were looking at farms out in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming. I participated in a couple of those. How did they get that virus in here when they're out in the middle of nowhere? So it wasn't like Iowa where you're a quarter mile from another farm. So that was one thing we learned, have those ready and available. The Swine Health Information Center, National Pork Board effort, I do have some slides on that. We'll talk about that as well. Emerging Disease Response Plan by National Pork Producers Council. And then the Swine Health Board is developed now with the National Pork Board, or Pork Producers Council. And so we'll talk about all those things in just a little bit. So the Swine Health Monitoring Project is a collaborative effort. The funding is coming from USDA, Pork Board, AASB, and NPPC. There again, it's producers willing to share information. There's 2.1 million sows in this group that are sharing on a weekly basis. 752 breeding herds and then the downstream flow. Data is collected and reported by the University of Minnesota. Dr. Dane Godey is in charge of that. And we get reports weekly by email. Right now they're tracking both PERS virus and they're tracking PED and Delta coronavirus. So if you look, this is 2013 going into 2014. It's the cumulative incidence by week. And that was when we had the peak disease, the new to our industry. This brown line here is 2014-2015. And we didn't really know what to expect this winter. We thought because it's an envelope virus, much like TGE. And we thought TGE tends to be a disease we see more in the wintertime. We thought, are we going to go through this thing again here? And so far we haven't. This is called an exponentially weighted moving average chart. It's essentially a statistic process control that epidemiologists use to track disease. And you can see 
a huge spike um, in uh, cases um, in 2013 and 14 going into 14, so the winter time there. And then just a little spike right here uh, this past year, this past winter. So not near as bad as we thought it would be, and uh, but I think we're pretty cautious. We need to get maybe into next year to see what happens, especially as our maybe our herd immunity starts tailing off with our replacement rates with new animals. Um, so we'll have to see what what happens there. Um, this is interesting. This is all from the same data. Uh, this is aggregate prevalence of sow herd status based on sow herd status, and uh, so if you look. The red is positive unstable, so that's all this red area here. So you can see there's, ant, there's farms out there that continue to have PD virus problems. Um, and a lot of people wonder why, and I think, uh, so a good example, I had Dr. Schwartz explain this to me from Iowa State Diagnostic Lab. It's not unusual for a two to three day old pig to shed one billion virons per one mil of feces. Okay, so let's say that one pig sheds 100 mils of feces, if you do the math and you come in with a procedure that's 99.99% effective, whether it's spray dried plasma or whether it's a disinfection, uh, whether it's sanitation plus disinfection, even when you get to a 99.99% effectiveness, which I take any day of the week, you still have a million virions left over in the environment waiting to infect that next animal. Okay? And this is uh, really difficult because. Uh, these viruses take mucosal immunity, and uh, so basically IgA that's secreted through the milk, um, and uh, then IgA that's produced to protect the gut, and uh, injectable vaccines uh, have been, in naive animals, not very effective because it produces mainly IgG, which is circulating antibodies and not mucosal. Once these animals get exposed to this live virus, um, you do get kind of a boost in uh, injectable vaccines. Uh, there's a couple companies out there today that make injectable vaccines. A lot of producers are using those because of uh, uh, fear of, of having this thing come back. And, and uh, so typically, you don't wean a pig. If you're continuously ferrying every week, you won't wean a pig for at least four weeks. And so you take a 1,000 sows, you're going to lose between 1,600 and, and 1,900 pigs during that four-week span. And it typically takes... Uh, for a farm to get back down to, to uh, baseline production, uh, typically it would take anywhere from uh, six to 14 days before the next group comes in and finally ferals and wanes a live pig. And uh, typically they figure eight days um, before you get back to, I'm sorry, weeks before you get back to, so anywhere from four to 14, excuse me, four to 14 days, not weeks, I apologize for that before you get, actually start having animals that are immune and can actually wean a pig and provide pigs with protection. The interesting group here that I think is uh, this group number two, which is here, and that's the darker yellow color, and that is, uh, that's herds of continually exposing animals, so they're propagating the virus and they're giving it to gilts, replacement gilts coming in. So essentially to make this virus go away within a farm, you, you go through the same thing you do with TG or any other more typical disease. You stop new entries of naive animals into the herd. You do that for a period of time. With PED, it's, it's eight to 12 weeks. Um, with PERS and mycoplasma, it takes 240, 250 days. Uh, this one's faster. But you also have people saying, well, I think I'm gonna go ahead and infect my gilts so they're immune before they walk in the door. And so when we're talking about elimination of PED, um, there's some large systems out there that are propagating this virus, and so we've got to, as an industry, if we're going to go that way, we have to stop that practice if we're going to try to eliminate it. Um, and of course, the green is all the, the negative herds that are out there. Light green is pre uh, provisionally negative, or we think they went negative. And the way that's being tested most often today is uh, we've learned very quickly that piglets like to chew, or pigs like to chew on ropes. So we'll hang ropes in pens and we'll wring out the ropes, collect the oral fluids, and that's a good monitoring device for PED, uh, as well as influenza, it even purrs. Um, the other thing they're doing is they're taking swippers, like you use to clean your floor, and actually go in and, and swab the floors in, in the uh, green herd barns 
And if they come back negative after two or three times of doing that, uh, they'll declare the farm negative because there's obviously no shedding going on at that point in time. You can do rectal swabs, you can collect feces, uh, you can do all those things as well. Uh, but to get a wide sample, it's either oral fluids, which doesn't work very well in sows, but it works pretty well in grow finish. And uh, so a lot of the breeding herds are using these Swiffer devices. And uh, put in a baggie, uh, add some phosphate but buffered saline, and submit that to the lab for PCR. So, um, so let's talk about the virus matrix exercise. This is the pathogen matrix exercise that I talked about. Uh, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians uh, we're working on. Um, so basically, um, the group at, at the Center for Epidemiology and Animal Health uh, helped put this list of viruses together that are known to infect swine. And so um, there's 44 some viruses here. And our challenge was to go ahead and rank these. And we wanted to rank them uh, based on four criteria. What is the economic impact of the domestic market? So essentially death loss. Um, what is the economic impact to exports? So we had the H1N1 influenza come in, exports went boom like that. Um, and uh, so it, that influenza virus had a huge impact on exports. Obviously classical swine fever, foot and mouth disease would, would dramatically impact our exports. Today we're, well it wasn't that long ago, we were running right at 26, 28 percent of our production was exported. So a huge amount of, of uh, impact on our industry if our exports stop. So foot and mouth disease, classical swine fever, anything like that that impacts uh, exports. Um, risk of introduction or reemergence in the United States. And so there again, African swine fever uh, keeps moving. That would be something to be concerned about. Uh, reemergence of pseudorabies um, in the U.S. swine herd would be something that would be concerned. Looking at what's going on in China and, and how much interaction we have with China and other countries today. Um, so we got to look at what's the chances of these viruses getting introduced to the United States. And, uh, and then, of course, is it zoonotic? And that's where H1N1 had a huge impact on both zoonotic capabilities as well as our export market. And so that's why I included Ebola as being a concern. Um, there again, it's right now on that list. It's on this list, but it basically, if you extend the, the list out, it says does not cause disease in swine today. So, um, uh, but it is something we have to look at. Okay? Uh, so we rank these viruses based on these. Um, so if you look at key viruses uh, as ranked by the Swine Health Committee at AASV, and these rankings I'm sure will change and they're going to be reevaluated all the time. And this isn't the order that they came out in, but I just picked off the top nine and, uh, and said, okay, here's the focus. And the reason for doing this is because we wanted to look at what are some of the uh, gaps in our knowledge base as far as how long does the virus last in the environment? What disinfectants will kill it? Um, do we have a test? Is there a vaccine somewhere in the world that we can use to, to uh, utilize to help us with these viruses? And so uh, foot and mouth disease, uh, obviously exports would go uh, uh, to zero. African swine fever as well. Influenza, just because it's zoonotic and the virus changes so much, is a huge one. Uh, classical swine fever, the same impact on exports as well as domestic. Pseudorabies virus, um, the fact that that might reemerge uh, is a concern. We know there's some feral swine in certain areas of the country that are positive for pseudorabies virus, yet today uh, we're uh, declared negative in our domestic population today in the United States. Swine vesicular diseases, I think uh, a great presentation on uh, uh, vesicular stomatitis. Um, actually, when I was in uh, Colorado working for another genetics company, uh, we had a huge sale going to Canada at the time. Landed this big contract with Big Sky, and uh, our animal production was in Colorado, and they diagnosed vesicular stomatitis. And, in Colorado and that whole thing went south because they wouldn't let us ship any animals up there. So uh, uh, so that's this one. Um, PERS virus is changing all the time. PERS virus, PERS virus, excuse me. PERS virus cost of industry in the United States about $621 million per year. And uh, so it's, it's, 
it's huge what it still costs us. And, and we've been working on this virus for, well, since 1988. And uh, we're learning more about it. We're learning how to control it uh, better. But it still is, uh, is really a, still a big, huge cost to our industry. And then, of course, uh, the swine enteric corona disease viruses, PD and, and uh, Delta Corona. Um, but we ranked all 44 of those viruses. Uh, some got zero for a score. We basically took this list and we applied numbers to each one of these, one, three, four, one, three, four on each one of these, and then uh, we collated those numbers and gave one score to each one of these viruses. Um, so that's that project. We're going to continue to look at these, probably expand it into other pathogens other than viruses, but this is where we're going to start uh, today and try to understand the, the knowledge gaps. Um, and then through that, uh, we're going to look at diagnostics. What do we need for diagnostics in each one of these? Do we have a, a, a rapid test for one of these diseases that we could jump on if it was ever introduced in the United States so we could actually detect it and then get a response plan to put together for that? PD, we didn't have a, we didn't have a test. It took us a while to get one developed. And, uh, and so these are lessons that we're kind of learned from the PD ex experience. Uh, animal movements, um, premises IDs, where we actually identify the premises with a number or a seven digit numeric character number or uh, ID. And uh, th those, right now we've got clearly north of 90% of our premises in the United States for swine premises are identified. Um, I would say, if we're lacking anything, we're not using it very well. Um, um, those, those IDs need to go on electronic health certificates. We can't have file cabinets for, full of paper health certificates. We've got to go plowing through. Uh, if they're electronic, we'll be able to have those uh, immediately. We need to look at PREM IDs and be able to trace animal movements uh, when needed. Epidemiology, uh, what are, what are, what's our knowledge base lacking in epidemiology of these viruses? And uh, there again, if we have premise ID numbers, uh, the pork board's arranged it so you can actually get online and you can print off barcodes so you're not transposing numbers. And so you just peel that barcode off, you stick it on your diagnostic sheet, you submit it, and all of a sudden you've got your uh, diagnostic diagnostics tied back to that premises ID. So that'll give you, number one, the date you sent it in, the date it was diagnosed, and where that virus is at at that point in time. So temporal spatial epidemiology will be possible at that point. Um, you know, when I was at PIC, we had uh, we actually went and had every farm required that we had multiplication on to go with prem IDs, and that had to be used for submission on the forms because we we had a automatic download of electronic diagnostic information, uh, and for a genetics company, that's that's we need to be able to convey our health status to everybody we're dealing with, whether it's a new customer or a customer that that has been with us for a long time. And before that, we would have farms like. A farm named Max L, and they might submit Max space capital L, Max dash L, Max L all one word, and so you might have four different identifiers for the same farm, and so this eliminated that issue. And uh, and then environmental viability, what disinfectants work the best? Uh, with PED, we know it's the oxidization or peroxide based. Um, Axel is one that's out there, and Vircon S both are very effective. Other ones are not so effective against PED. And there again, we had to do the research quick to figure that out. What disinfectants should we be using on this virus? Because we didn't have any research on it at that point in time. Um, other things are immunity. If an animal gets infected, how long is the, uh, the immunity within that animal post-infection? Is that female, if she's in the herd for two and a half, three years, is she immune during that whole time? Or does it tail off and then she becomes success susceptible again? Uh, we talked about vaccine gaps. What are the vaccine gaps we have for each one of those viruses? Do we have a vaccine that's effective? If not, what do we need to do to get one kind of on the, on the shelf so we can pull it off and say, okay, we now have a vaccine that we think is effective? Um, what's the pathogenesis? Uh, what's the biosecurity by herd and by region? Transportation, we know it's a huge uh, method of moving this virus around. And uh, simply, when you look at as many trucks as we have on the road every day, we just can't wash them all. It's difficult. Uh, you can control those movements. 
especially if you're emptying a finishing barn, they can go to the packing plant, come back, and maybe not, but if they go someplace else, they need to be washed. Anybody that heard uh, Dr. Baker's talk yesterday about USDA working with, uh, uh, with our industry on, on trying to identify truck washes, what do they have for services, are they using hot water, are they using disinfectant, what's the, the pressure per square inch they're using when they're, when they're washing, recycled water, clean water. Uh, Dr. Lowe did some work on market transport. And what's interesting is he found that 17% of the trailers that went to market for a packing plant, for example, were infected on arrival. He also found for every negative tractor, tractor trailer that came in, one additional trailer left infected. So they're picking it up at the packing plant and taking it back home. An eye-opener for me was um, when country of origin labeling happened, uh, a lot of these packing plants wanted all the Canadian sourced pigs delivered at night. Well, typically in the daytime, you back up and you get on your pickup, your truck, and you unload the animals, and somebody down below takes them and puts them in pens. Okay? At night, that additional help's not there. And so the, tr the truck driver not only has to unload 25 or 10, 15 head, but then he's got to walk down through the larage and then pen those pigs and then come back up on his vehicle. And so um, there again, a lot of opportunity to, to infect that trailer and bring it back, as well as infect his cab um, if he doesn't do the right booting operations. And then what's the global distribution of these viruses? And there again, you look at African swine fever, how it's moving. Uh, in 2012, we got kind of a verbal warning from somebody that looks at these diseases saying, hey, PED's moving around China quite a bit. We need to be careful. And we just, you know, ignored it. We're not going to ignore those things anymore. Uh, so it's kind of stimulated this, the development of what we call a Swine Health Information Center. And so the mission of the Swine Health Information Center is to protect and enhance the health of the U.S. swine herd through, number one, targeted research, uh, analysis of swine health data, monitoring for trends and data analysis, and then monitoring disease globally. Okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> this is going to be a virtual center, so it's not going to be, there's not like going to be bricks and mortar. It's a virtual center. Uh, it'll provide direction and oversight of programs. Uh, they'll have focused task force that will be focused on different technical issues. Uh, the pork board has uh, come up with funding, $15 million a year for five years. At the end of five years, the Swine Health Information Center has to proven that it actually has done something and it's worthwhile to spend and to re-up. And so there'll be, uh, uh, there's a board of directors um, that has veterinary representation on it. And these board of directors will, with the pork board, decide after five years, does funding continue or not. Um, they're going to utilize, utilize Ag Connect systems um, to access health data, which was a, a Department of Homeland Security funded, I believe, Texas A&M. Uh, to develop a, it was FADSI, FASD was what it was called before, is that right? Did I get that right? Yeah, so now it's going to be Ag Connect, and uh, there again, it's, it's not FOIL uh, accessible, so the data is confidential, and we're just, and we're not collecting data through this center, we're just going out and, and grabbing it and going to analyze it. Uh, complete transparency of sharing health information, because it's not FOILable, Producers now are not going to be as concerned about the confidentiality issue. And so that's going to be huge. Um, the Swine Health Information Center is a tool to improve health management within the national swine herd. Um, it is a way to, to improve a non-regulatory disease response. So we're not sitting there for two weeks saying, well, who's going to jump in and do something? Uh, and it does enhance ASV, MPPC, and pork board. This is not a disease response plan. It's not an FAD surveillance response, surveillance or response. It's not duplication of efforts done by these groups. And we're not collecting a huge database. And there will be a swine health board that this information will fit, will uh, fill into. And the swine health board then will make the decision. And it'll be do nothing, it could be torch the earth, and everything in between. But they'll be the ones that will make that decision based on the information coming from the Swine Health Information Center. And what's interesting, back in 1999, this book was published, and uh, Jim McKean was a big part of this. There was four or five people, Larry Miller, Beth Watner, um, 
put the Swine Futures Project together back then. It was published in 1999, and it provided a blueprint for comprehensive surveillance and information um, management system for emerging disease responses. And uh, if you look at the Swine Health Information Center and then the Swine Health Board, it has different names in this document, but uh, basically it's the same concept. And so it's something the pork industry's had and wanted for a long, long time, and uh, we're now going to get there. So it's about that thick. I think it's online within USDA. You can get on their website, um, and you can pull it off of there. So um, this is a quote I actually got from Paul Sundberg. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, and uh, we don't want to repeat what happened with PED, or the next virus could be even worse.